Hey everybody, you might know me as Robbie's Reptiles, but what if I told you now I'm actually Robbie's Roly Polies? Today we're talking about my new recent obsession, which is getting into isopods. I'm sure a lot of you guys already have them and have been working with them for a while. I recently discovered this new world of breeding and selling high-end, high, high-end high Roly Polies. I'm sure that you guys all know that they're called isopods. I'm just calling them Roly Polies because me, I've been into this for about a month now. So this is all very new to me. And I wanted to show off some of the roly polies that I now have in my collection and hopefully soon we'll be able to start selling them. But it's been what uh, it's been such a new interesting experience. I feel like a kid again getting into crested geckos or getting into reptiles for the first time and having to learn all the different species and genetics and all the different patterns and the market values of everything. It's been a wild world, let me tell you. But if you want me to get into the specifics about the financial incentive for getting into these, that's going to be a members only video. But for everybody else, we're just going to take a look at some of these really pretty isopods that I've gotten and which ones I'm really excited about. And I'm sure you'll find out a few tips about care, husbandry, diet, everything like that. Okay, so first we need to go over how this all really started in the first place. So this is essentially a colony that I started from the wild i just at the time it was nice and humid out a lot of rain going on so i just went outside and picked up a bunch of roly polies that i found i don't know any of the scientific names by the way so bear with me here i believe it was vulgare is one that i found and then powder blues are the other ones that i found and this is just what i found outside in my backyard because i had heard that people sell these pretty well at shows that apparently there's a whole huge world of having them as a hobby so I thought that I needed to give it a try, and this was my trial run, and I fell in love with keeping them. So these are a mixture of the Volgari and the Powder Blues. Keep in mind, I started with only about 15 of each of random ones that I found outside, and now we have this. So this is pretty much how I keep most of them. This is covered in mold over here, but they're absolutely thriving, so I'm just not going to change anything that I have going on here. The only ventilation that I have are two little holes that I drilled in, or I guess eight holes that I drilled on either side, and they seem to be thriving. This is pretty much going to be the setup for every single enclosure that we go over. So you give them moss. This is sphagnum moss that I find on Amazon, and if you guys want, everything will be linked down below, especially these tubs, and we'll talk about that in a second. So this sphagnum moss has plenty of humidity, and it's very moist because roly-polies are actually crustaceans, and the way that they breathe is through water. So if they don't have this, they actually will die. Mainly that's the most important thing. Make sure that they're humid here, but the interesting thing is it seems that most of the time with these, what you need to do is give them only this to be damp or humid or moist, and then the rest needs to be dry. So it's been, it's been fun trying to figure out the right system, but I think I've got a good system for these guys. Originally, I had them in a really small tub, and I forgot about them for four months. I never sprayed them. I didn't feed them. I came back and they absolutely exploded. And whenever I flip these over, if you look closely, you probably can already see a bunch here inside of these cracks. But look at how many there are. These are just the powdered blues, it looks like. And there's actually some oranges that popped up. These are literally... They started from 15 guys. You just give them some bark to hide in and you know, I feed them fish flakes. Uh, I also, this soil is actually just soil that I shoveled up from my goat area. So it's full of goat poop, uh, hay. It's just whatever was outside because these are wild. So I figured whatever is outside is good enough for them. Uh, and I haven't had any issues with any dying. There's no pesticides on my property as well, which is an important thing to do. So these dark ones are the vulgari. These are the ones that are just your standard, your absolute bog standard roly-poly. Uh, but yeah, they all seem to be thriving well, and there's tons of these little tiny babies everywhere, in the soil especially. This is a goat bone that I've given them, extra calcium, another goat bone. This was just a giant pile of bug burger, and if you look closely, there's like infinite little tiny little babies in it. And again, this is probably not how you should keep them, but these are just the ones that I found outside. This was my experiment. This other one, tons right there. And so I'm actually considering using these powder blues as a feeder for my crested geckos. I think it would be so easy, almost no upkeep. Feed them whatever you want, really, and they'll thrive. Because worst comes to worst, 
all of these guys will just eat the dirt, the soil, and the leaves. That's primarily what isopods eat. They decompose. So you could even just not feed them if you wanted, and they would still thrive and breed. So I think that powder blues and powder oranges might possibly be like the best, most passive way of breeding feeders for your crested geckos. So I'm going to test that out. Again, guys, this started with only about 15. So remember that. Keep that in mind. This is a tub that I got at Target. Uh, I'm sure that there are ones just like it at, uh, on Amazon. So what is different about this is that the lids actually have this like foam. This is rubber, actually. This one specifically. And they all lock because apparently the itty bitty freshly born or hatched little roly polies can climb this smooth plastic. So that is something to note is that they are able to climb the plastic. The very, very tiny little babies. These aren't my really expensive ones. So I haven't covered these, all the holes with screen or anything. Again, they're absolutely thriving. So I've just figured if it isn't broke, don't fix it. But I use these tubs because another isobod breeder told me that it's really important to invest in the more expensive tubs that are waterproof is what they're labeled as so that you can completely seal it off so that little babies can't just crawl out. Other ones that I have in just normal six quarts, the babies could potentially just crawl out. But these are the wild types. Let's look at the other ones. These are my lavas, um, which I believe are Porcelio Scaber, I think. Pretty much same setup. They've got their drinking area over here. This is just a piece of driftwood that I found outside. I live in an area where driftwood is plentiful. Then we also give them cuddle bone because that's good for them. These guys specifically, these lavas, are apparently very prolific breeders. So I got 150 of them to start. So these are the lavas. And they're named that obviously because they kind of look like molten magma. It's not necessarily genetic. I'm sure that you could line breed these though to some success. But uh, yeah, it just seems that, you know, it's a random chance that they have this cool pattern. I love these. I think that they're going to be a pretty good species to keep. They've been thriving. You'll also see lots of little tiny springtails. Springtails are absurdly important to keeping isopods, apparently, because oftentimes they can't eat all the food fast enough uh, if you overfeed, which me just learning how to do all of this, I overfeed quite a lot by accident. The springtails are going to help clean up all the mold, eat all the poop, anything like that, anything that the actual isopods aren't able to eat the springtails will clean up after them most of them though are under this driftwood i wouldn't recommend using this large of a driftwood i just did because i thought it would look pretty i'm now realizing it's not worth it it's better to just use all that bark then they have this deer jaw that i found outside i did bake some of the stuff but i've heard so many different mixed opinions on well if you bake it then there isn't going to be any natural uh, you know, living organisms that are found outside, they'll eat all the mold. And if you bake it, then it's much more prone to molding, stuff like that. I don't know, guys. I'm figuring this all out as I go. But they seem to be thriving. I feed them fish flakes every now and then. Looks like they ate all of it. And then uh, I got some of this really nice rotted wood on eBay, which I cannot believe that I bought rotting wood on eBay. Uh, I vowed that I'm never going to buy leaves. I think that that is a sin. But yeah, so these are my lavas. Let's go and look at the... Let's look at another species. These are cappuccino isopods, not to be confused with cappuccino crested geckos. So I went pretty hard into these. I went ahead and purchased 100 of these. A species like this, the cappuccinos, they sell for, I believe it's 10 for like 180 or $150. I've even seen some people list these five for $250. You know, I can't even wrap my head around a roly-poly being this expensive, but they are. This species does like deeper substrate and a little bit more humidity. So I did spray pretty heavily on, especially on the moss, but also in deep into the soil. It's very loose soil. Soil is super important. And I actually bought this from someone that makes a special isopod soil. Again, I had no idea that this is a whole world. But anyway, let's see if there's some under here. Beautiful. These are cappuccinos. Don't they just look like little tasty coffee beans? Uh, these are Cubaris. I believe they don't have a specific name yet, so they are just called a Cubaris species. But that one seems to be like a little brighter than the others. These are a little bit more white. It's common for when you're producing stuff at such a scale like this, the genetic anomalies pop out left and right. In fact, with my wild types that I showed earlier, 
I already had a anomaly born. It looks to be like pied or something. When the usual wild type is just this dark. These are originally from Thailand, I believe. I just love the color. So yeah, I got these just because they're one, pretty expensive. And I think that that, that just really intrigues me. But they're really pretty. I really like the earthy tones on these guys. And so yeah, we got a starter colony of 100. I might actually bite the bullet and get more. I did actually put an entire colony um, of springtails inside of here to jumpstart the colony. Always so scared to set the wood back down. I'm terrified that I'm gonna kill one of them. I'm not gonna bother them too much. I've probably had them out already too long. That's another thing that I've noticed is that if you neglect them, then they will thrive. They do much better if you never look at them and never touch them. So it's kind of an oxymoron. People have these as pets, but uh, they're best if you never look at them, never touch them, never bother them. That's how you get them to thrive. So I just think that's kind of funny. These ones right here are actually some of my absolute favorites. I don't know the scientific name, don't at me. These are papayas, which essentially just look like pink, regular roly polies, which I think is really cute. It's kind of a valuable time for me right now because not being an experienced isopod person, I'm able to get into the ones that me as an inexperienced person would find interesting and beautiful without having any knowledge or knowing like, you know, ooh, those are really rare, so they're really valuable because of that. I'm kind of not influenced by anything like that right now. So I got 250 of these ones just because I think that they are so pretty and I think that anybody could appreciate them, even people that are totally not into isopods. They're just like these really cute pink roly polies. I really like them. They're already breeding for me too. You can see a couple of the babies in there or as the experts call them, mankai, but they are thriving in here, doing really well. Yeah, you can see a couple babies. Oh, that's great. That means that they're comfortable and breeding. And uh, if you look, there's actually a ton of these lying around. That's actually the scales from my shingleback's shed. I fed them a ton of it, and it seems that they won't eat this part. This part's really tough. But these are the papayas. Let's move on. Much more of a common species here, but I like them. These are other ones that I'm considering using as feeders. These are orange powders, which are exactly the same as blue powders, I believe. These aren't necessarily roly-polies. These are the ones that aren't roly-polies. You can see my knowledge, it's vast. Super active species. I can never feed them enough, honestly. They're constantly on the move, constantly eating. This is probably, you know, a really good species to have as a pet. They're very outgoing. Absolutely thriving. There's also tons of little tiny babies already. They're thriving. Each one of these, I believe, has 30 babies at a time, and they'll have babies once or twice a month. So you can see the potential for them being feeders. They start out so unbelievably tiny. There's even tinier ones the camera probably can't even pick up. And then they get pretty large, large enough that even at a full adult size, though, a baby crested gecko could eat no problem. These are also really inexpensive, which is great. Super expensive in terms of feeders, but really inexpensive in terms of pet isopods. Next up, this is a staple in every isopod collector's collection, dairy cows. Robbie, why are they called dairy cows? Well, I'm glad that you asked because they look like little cows. Those are all the springtails, not little babies. A lot of springtails in this one. Dairy cows are one of the most common. They're prolific, they breed super fast, they eat a ton. Uh, and they get pretty large, actually, compared to my finger. Pretty large for a uh, isopod. If you wanted, I guess you could also use these as feeders. Um, they are a little bit more expensive. And honestly, it's probably more worth it to use the powders as feeders. These guys do go for a little bit more. Dairy cows are more so cleanup crew. That's the main reason why I haven't even talked about that. Main reason why people would have these in the first place are cleanup crew. Wow, that one just took a giant piece of that one right there is picking up that fish flake and eating it. Isopods, primarily, people get them to have as a cleanup crew in bioactive tanks. So uh, I've been debating on having a couple of bioactive tubs, actually, in all my breeder setup. Something that I'm tossing around the idea for. Now, these are a rarer, more expensive version of a very common isopod. These are pandas, but specifically, they are red pandas which for me, when I first saw them, I knew it was gonna be like my absolute favorite. So these ones I've noticed actually dig more 
look closely, they are just red and white. And the pandas are like this, but they're black pattern. And so these ones are just red pattern variants. I wish that they were all out. This is actually the, so these are the smaller tubs that I use. I'll have these linked below. These also still have the gasket on top. Luckily, only two latches though, much easier to work with. These are some of my absolute favorites. These are called maples. I don't know the scientific name, but they are so unbelievably beautiful. These ones are super orange with like a white skirt all around them. I'm hoping that these end up being just as prolific as something like that the orange and blue powders. So far they haven't produced anything yet, but they have been eating all their food really well. So that's a plus. Isopods or the springtails have taken over too, which is good. So it should be a pretty good symbiotic relationship they form. These ones, I believe the market value roughly is like 10 for 60, but I have about 20 maples in there. These next ones are from a friend slash employee. Uh, he just dropped off his collection here. These are Pak Chong Cubaris. These guys are really interesting. They're like black with red markings on the head and tail. Lots of springtails in here. There's a little mankai, a little baby. Uh, but yeah, these guys I think are like 10 for $70 or something like that. They don't like people. They don't like being touched or anything. So here I am grabbing them, touching them. These are another one that has to be my favorite. Uh, these are red tigers. I don't know what species or what scientific names they are. Again, sorry guys, I am not knowledgeable yet. But these ones are really pretty. I was able to haggle someone down and get them for a really good price. You can look right there. That's one of them. That one's really orange. Look at that one. Hoping that these ones start breeding for me. There's 13 in here. I got a 10 pack. It seems to be pretty standard that most breeders will throw in. If you get 10, you'll get 12 or something like that, uh, which is nice because something like this, you know, my number one fear getting into, you know, this is more expensive. I think these are like 10 for $80 usually. Getting into something like that, knowing that you're only getting 10 for almost $100. The idea of even two of them dying, you know, that's a, a big loss. So it's nice that it's pretty standard for people to throw in extra. But yeah, just a new world that I'm getting into, and it's so fascinating. That's pretty much it, guys. Uh, you know, I have more, but they're either not out or they're just not that interesting for me to note in the video. But uh, make sure to like, subscribe, all the YouTube mumbo jumbo. Thank you for watching. If you guys want more isopod content, you know, become a member. I'm going to be uploading some more isopod specific videos there. And yeah, thanks for joining.